Hello everyone, Karnasa here, and welcome to Kerbal Gets Real Redux. In this series, I'll be taking on RP1's programs and launch complexes update, and complex is certainly the right word for it. Seriously, I feel like I need a degree in micromanagement to be efficient at this. I'll be seeing just how far I can get, and who knows, maybe this time round, I'll finally be able to land a Kerbal on Jupiter. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Before diving straight into 1951, there's a few things to go over first. The goal for this series is to try and be all historical milestones, something I have found quite a bit more challenging with programs and all additional updates to RP1 since Kerbal Gets Real, the original, aired. And speaking of, this is a complete reboot. You do not have to have watched the original to start watching this. But if you do fancy checking it out, well, here's a card to go see what happened there. The structure for this series will remain the same as the last one. Every episode will cover a year of in-game events. Although, like last time, that may change later down the line if the videos end up getting too long. Trying to fit 20 launches in the space of a single video would be quite ridiculous. My aim for the episodes is to release one every week on Sunday, but as always, life and other series may get in the way of that schedule. Yes, For All Kerbal Kind will take precedence once everything is back on track for me to resume filming for that. And for those of you that have asked, it is returning. We're just currently working through some kinks in our updated install. As for Coming Home Redux, I also want to finish that, but have been seriously unmotivated to work on that series. I'd rather not try churning out something half-baked when my heart isn't really in it and actually give the ending of that series the full attention it deserves. It isn't helped by the fact that install takes a good 40 minutes to open now, but at some point in the future I hope to get that all completely done and finished. Not entirely sure why the start of this episode turned into a general update video, but with all of that out of the way it's time to delve in to Kerbal Gets Real Redux. So to kick things off, a new save. This install has been made on KSP 1.12.3, and the mod set I'm using was at the time of recording a fully up-to-date RP1 Express install. I don't even need to save programs anymore, because that's just what RP1 is these days. Nice. I have made a few edits, such as adding some of the near future mods, ones compatible with RP1 anyway. Principia, Scansat, I know we're not supposed to use it because it eats RAM like a diabetic child having a hypo, trust me, I've experienced both, but I just can't stop myself from getting those lovely in-game maps. And I'm using Blackrack's volumetric cloud, rather than standard EVE. The config for that is Ballistic Fox's RSS Reborn. It is quite incredible looking. Full mod list and install guide can be found in the description, as well as relevant links to get you there. The options I've gone for this run are pretty much what the normal preset gives you. However, I have made comms required for control, and turned lifetime radiation on for Kerbals, because I'm a sadist and want to see them sprouting extra limbs. <coughs> I've set engine spec level to sci-fi, because if it's in the game, I want to use it, and I've aptly named the save Kerbal Gets Real 2, because I'm great at titles. After some unsavory events at the start of the 20th century, the countries of the world decided to get together, hold hands, and focus on space. That means in this series, I'll not be limiting myself to any nation's tech. Every engine will be available to me, should I wish to pursue it. I've already got For All Kerbal Kind for that challenge. I will, however, be launching from Florida, despite what you may have heard, it's actually quite pretty, at least with the Canapple HD mod installed. My agency this time round is EA ESA, the Earth Aeronautics and Space Administration. Naming so far is going great. I have made custom flags for this series, all of which can be found on my Patreon, as well as naming rights to Kerbals in Save. If you want to grab those or have a sacrifice named after you, go check it out. Plug aside, we're at the Space Center, January 1st, 1951. Over this save, I'm going to be telling you exactly what we're doing. I've had a lot of people tell me from the last series it really helped them to get into RP1 and helped their own careers, and I'm hoping that I can somewhat replicate that, especially with programs being so vastly different from what's come before. Just bear in mind I may make some mistakes myself, this being the first time in the update I've gone past first orbit. Okay then, straight in to the administration building, where I pick up my first couple of programs. I need to make money after all, and for this, I've gone with Suborbital and X-Plane Research, and picked them both up at fast speed. X-Plane funding is three times the amount I would get having picked up early rocket development, so it seemed a bit of a no-brainer. If I want to beat milestones, I need cash. For the other program, I could have gone with either suborbital or early rocket development, but for this run, I didn't feel like doing 5,000 kilometers down range. At this point in older versions of the program's update, you'd also pick up your leaders. We'll get onto that, but for now they're locked behind milestones. This is definitely not something I'll forget about when I get the option to appoint them. Seriously, I wish you'd get a notification when someone either retires or you can appoint someone new. Would be nice. Next up, starting contracts. With programs picked, we've gained a few to choose, but starting simply, I've gone for breaking the sound barrier and the Kármán line. As well well as first launch. Pretty simple. Now, for staffing. 10 go into R&D, and 10 go into engineering. The first launch complex I'll be building can only house 10 engineers anyway, and we actually start off with some research already unlocked, so I can immediately start unlocking new techs, which I do, and pick up supersonic plane development and post-war rocketry testing, both which will make X-planes go. <laughs> 
Okay, enough admin, time for building. Into the hangar and in typical blue piece of fashion, here's one I prepared earlier. Using research credits you start with, I was able to tool up the plane, unlock all the parts necessary, and start building it at the hangar. If I want this built as fast as possible, looks like I'll need another couple of engineers, but hey, they're cheap labor and don't ask for much. I'm sure I'll be just fine. Starting a new save in RP1 no longer hires four astronauts at the beginning, so that's next on the list because I would quite like someone to fly this, else it's not going to go far at all. Heading into the astronaut complex, I pick the most courageous, least stupid pilot possible. Say hello to George Edwards. Keep an eye out on her, she's going to be pretty important. Astronaut picked, there's still another couple of things I want to do before getting the clock rolling. Like I said, something something degree something micromanagement. Yeah, there's a lot in this update. I currently do not have any launch complexes available to me. I need to build one, so I went into the VAB and designed a pretty basic sounding rocket, the Blue Sky. Going through the different upgrades on the U-1250 that will power this rocket, I noticed that the fuel will not ever change, so I don't have to worry about editing my LC with new fuel mixtures, at least not for a while. However, I do add more than was provided by default. This will make the build time a little longer and make the complex a bit more costly, but it will save me repeatedly coming in and out of the VAB just to upgrade a complex. Seriously, the amount of loading screens I've had to edit out over the course of this series is pretty damn high. Can we get to launching yet? Not quite, because in the name of efficiency and wanting to get a slightly bigger rocket out by the end of the year, I want to build my second launch complex at exactly the same time as the first. This one, however, will take a little longer because it's a tad bigger. Having played through the program's update briefly before, I was quite confident that these two complexes with only slight upgrades should be more than enough to last me until first orbit, and actually even make first orbit possible on the bigger Thunderbolt complex. This was a bit more of a hassle getting right, because unlike the U1250, the RD100 engine does change its fuel mixture, so I added in some ethanol 90, along with what else was required. Making the maximum tonnage 18 for now should mean I get quite a few launches out of this, but I know it will need to be upgraded eventually. Some of those camera contract requirements are going to need quite quite a hefty vehicle. I stated it last time round I did RP1, but with PNLC it's even more important to try and reutilize designs as much as possible. Not only for cost cutting, but also to allow complexes to build efficiency. I'm editing this having already reached 1962 in the save. Yeah, I've been playing a bit forward. And I've only just in the last year stopped using the Thunderbolt complex in favor of something a bit bigger. It did go through several upgrades, but it remained the same one all that time. I still actually have it built and might come back to it too if I find a use for smaller payloads down the line. Finally, able to move the clock forward, I made sure that most of my funding was spent. Hiring a lot more researchers than engineers because right now I can only use 12 and I want to get techs unlocking as soon as possible. If I overdid it, I can always fire some later on. World's best boss. Hovering over the funding screen, I can see that I'm still making a profit daily. As long as that remains in the black, I'm quite happy. It means I can work towards hiring more staff and building rockets and planes when I need to. As with old RP1, you really don't want to have much money in the bank at all. You want to invest as much of that as possible. So that's exactly what I'm going to be doing over the course of this series and running my space agency into the ground at every possible opportunity. After a month, the Blue Sky Complex is finished and I needed to start splitting my engineers. Not shown as me going back into the VAB to build the first Blue Sky. It's not exactly exciting footage. Skipping ahead to the 17th of February, the SST is done, making sure I put in any funding towards more researchers whenever I could. And now my budget was looking pretty tight. But with George instructed on how not to crash by giving her 55 minutes of training, it's time for the first flight of this series. So George Edwards has been strapped into the SST-1, and on the 17th of February 1951 she takes off, and I feel this is the perfect time to talk a little bit about how I'm doing the voiceover for this series, because it's a little bit different from usual. During the flight sections of the video, such as now, I am just going to be doing ad-lib. I'm not going to script this at all, this is just going to be what comes off the top of my head. Whereas during the Space Center section, I'm going to be scripting that entirely. Now the reason for this is I want to play on a bit of nostalgia and go back to the sort of voiceover that I was doing in the original Kerbal Gets Real, which is why I'm keeping that style in for these sections of the video. But I also want to bring in some of my new techniques and new things that I have learned over the three years of doing this channel and kind of using a bit of the knowledge that I have gained from doing Farewell. That's another series that I do actually want to finish. I didn't even mention that before when I was talking about coming home and for all Kerbal 
have, but no, I definitely want to finish that still. But obviously I have grown a lot over the past three years and I want to use some of those newfound skills to make these videos a little bit better. But you have to let me know which method you actually prefer in the comments because I, I, I quite like the new style of scripting. I, I think it makes the videos flow a bit better and usually end up being a bit funnier. But obviously this is just me talking from my heart, okay? It's, it's something that I do like doing and it's quite similar to streaming to be honest and that is something else <laughs> that, that I need to do that I've not done for quite some time. I've not really had the setup the past few months but I do now. So maybe that is something that I could definitely be doing in the near future. Anyway, the SST-1, it's powered by a single Derwent jet engine. The only jet engine that you have at the beginning of an RP-1 career, at least I'm fairly sure there might be another one. I'm, I'm gonna have to fact check myself on that. Yeah, it's not a very powerful jet engine at all and I've gone for a Delta Wing design, you know, because it's quite supersonic capable. It, it, it looks like something that should be supersonic. I mean, Concorde had a Delta Wing and that went very, very, very fast and you tend to see Delta Wings on supersonic capable planes. I'm not really that good at making planes at all in this game, which is why in the original Kerbal Gets Real, I never bothered making X planes at all because I, I didn't really know how they worked. I've got a little bit better and I have a bit more of an understanding about how planes fly now and how to make them look a bit better and fly a bit better, but I'm still definitely not the expert. There are people on YouTube who do series that are much, much, much better at planes than me. Take Calvin McClaw, for example, and I'll put a card to his channel now. He is absolutely fantastic at designing planes, and actually, I went to him over the course of filming some of the episodes in this series to help me out with some problems I was having completing one of the X-Plane contracts, which I absolutely will get to in a future episode. Anyway, I was able to make this plane go supersonic, and after that, I was safely able to put George Edwards back down on the shuttle runway. I don't really think we should have a shuttle runway yet, because we are quite far away from any shuttle launches, but it is the longest runway at the Cape, and not using flaps or spoilers meant that I really needed that extra length to slow down before running off the end. All in, a pretty successful flight. And I have to say, I'm fairly sure it's November of the RO team that worked on these newspaper clippings documenting your achievements in the run, and they are really quite fantastic. I've certainly been using them liberally over the course of both this episode and the trailer, and I'll definitely keep using them. Unfortunately, with my current design, I won't be able to complete any of the additional X-Plane contracts. Doing a nosedive to gain speed is a big no-no for future ones, as they all require level flight. Most of those will have to wait until I unlock better engines. And because of the way science works in RP1, I also gained no additional tech points, so nothing new to spend for now. So a quick warp ahead to March for the first rocket flight of this series. In the meantime, spending all my money on research teams. Now up to 50, tech should start coming in fairly quickly, which means I definitely need to earn some science, otherwise I'll be in a bit of a pickle. Okay, 12 and a half minutes into a Kerbal video, and it's the first time I'm going to be launching a rocket. Yes, it's finally here. The first sounding rocket that we're going to be launching in this series, Blue Sky 1. I've gone for the Russian Arabi equivalent, the U1250 for this, rather than the Arabi, because I pretty much spammed Arabis before, and having a look at the Delta V stats, or the specific impulse that the U1250 provides, I actually think it might be a slightly better engine. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I really need to test them against each other and see sort of the basic numbers look promising and I thought well I might as well give myself the biggest advantage that I can. Anyway it's our first launch of the series using engines that can fail and would you guess what happens engines did fail. Yes the U1250 failed seven seconds into the flight. The tiny tim that was on the bottom of this basically provided all of the thrust for this entire rocket flight. Yeah we didn't get very far. In fact I didn't even get the opportunity to gain any flying high science. Yes it failed that early and that means for this flight, I will gain no science whatsoever, which is going to be a bit problematic because, as I did mention before, I am researching things very, very quickly and I do not want to make my researchers be wasting their time twiddling their thumbs doing whatever they do when they don't have any technological projects to work on. No, we, do, we don't want to be wasting those at all. It would be rather silly. Having only got 28 kilometers in altitude meant that this was going to take a little while to get down and unfortunately, because it's in the atmosphere, I can't just pop back to the space center. No, because that would revert my flight back to the launch state. Anyway, this did make it back down to the ground eventually, and for some unknown reason, the avionics on it actually survived. I don't know how that happened, considering they were the top of the rocket and should have been the first thing that hit the ground. The rest of the rocket disassembled, but no, the avionics survived, which I guess it gets me a little bit of funding back. 
That was really less than ideal. Unfortunately, test flight has cursed me, and I still have no science. Although, as the Blue Sky rocket is pretty cheap, we'll only have to wait just over a month before we can launch a second one. Making no edits, because changing nothing and expecting it to succeed a second time round is a very sound thought process, one that I like to live by. Before then though, the Thunderbolt launch complex has been built, so I venture into the VAB. To tour the rocket and build one, well, I would have done if I had the money to afford the integration costs. Sometimes, running the space center to the ground might not be the best of ideas. Having nothing in construction at the moment though means my daily funding is quite comfortable, so after four days on the 4th of April, I just have enough to integrate my first guided rocket. But despite putting all my available engineers in the complex, it won't be done until 1957. Looks like I might need a few more. So while waiting for the launch of the next Blue Sky on the 1st of May, I had to babysit this warp. And whenever I got over 300 funds, that went straight into a new engineer, which went straight into building Thunderbolt 1. I really would quite like to get this out before the end of the year, but the second Blue Sky is finished, and this time I'm really hoping for some science. Getting that Carmen Line contract done would be pretty nice too. So yes, just over a month later, on the 1st of May 1951, Blue Sky 1 version 2 is launched. And yeah, I have made absolutely no changes to this rocket at all. Because it was a test flight error, I simulated this quite a bit and it worked every time. And I could actually get over the Kármán line. And not just the Kármán line, this can actually make it all the way to space, to 140 kilometers. And now with the engine having finished its burn, we can see that we have indeed done that. Now in order to achieve this, I am over -burned burning the U1250 a little bit. I have found with test flight, and I mean, I might be speaking a little bit too early here, considering I have had a failure of it already, but test flight is a lot less punishing when it comes to over burning engines, at least in my experience. Over the old test flight that I was using in the original Kerbal Gets Real, that may be a bit of a positive because it means that you can tend to over burn things without too much of a hassle, but it does have its drawbacks as well. The main one I can think of, if you have an engine with multiple ignitions that fail then you cannot relight it. Yeah, that's a bit annoying and a lot more punishing. Oh well, that's something I won't have to be dealing with at least for a little while yet. Finally, the common line has been breached, and we've been to space for all of about one minute. Completing that contract gave me 10 free applicants at least, all of which go straight into the Thunderbolt complex. Not only did we pass the common line, but this rocket also made it ever so briefly to space as defined by RO, which gave a few altitude records, as well as netting me some much needed science, which was spent immediately on early tracking systems and post-war materials science. In order to complete the suborbital program, tracking systems is going to be vital, as the biological sample is locked behind it, something I need for one of the required contracts. Next up, Blue Sky 2. Not even a month later, the efficiency multiplier is really starting to work now. Wanting the launch to get me more than just science, a quick hop into mission control to pick up an altitude contract. So on the 28th of May, Blue Sky 2 was launched, featuring an upgraded engine, and that's about it. Not even upgraded tanks yet, because I haven't quite researched them. However, it does mean that I can get away with that tiny tin booster. It is gone, and the reason for that, if I want to burn the upgrade to the U1250 to full completion, well, adding a solid rocket booster on the bottom of it will take it over one ton. And unfortunately, I only have the one ton launch pad. Anyway, this launch was more than capable of lifting 75 units of sounding payload in a high pressure tank at the top of this rocket to the required altitude. With the altitude contract complete, confidence was earned. Well, maybe not from you, and I wouldn't blame you, but in-game confidence. Critically important to amass this, as this is what I'll need to spend in order to unlock faster programs. And speed is of course very important. With more science comes the unlock of early solid rocket engines, as I'll need those to better improve the blue sky. Having now researched the first rocketry node, it was time to think about the first crewed altitude contract I had. Reaching 12 and a half kilometers seemed pretty trivial, but the plane used for this needed a rocket engine. So I did what I know best. I ripped out the jet, from SST and stuck on an XLR-11. This did, however, need high-pressure tanks, so the entire plane pretty much needed to be remade. Shame. Still, it wasn't too long before the plane was refurbished and ready to be air-launched. Once again, being the only pilot that I have, George Edwards is strapped into the XPT. Yeah, I'm very inventive with names for this series, the X-Plane Test 001 Altitude, because all I want to do for this flight is to go higher than 12 and a half kilometers. I am using the basic cockpit, which cannot go higher than 16 kilometers. I do need to unlock the Mark 1 cockpit from the supersonic tech node before I can attempt to go any higher than that. But with the XLR-11 on the back of this and multiple simulations to find out both where I need to air launch this so 
I can get back to the runway and to see if it will actually complete the contract, I was fully confident in my abilities to fly this plane and get it back safely and not kill my only astronaut in the process. I always do worry a little bit about air launching because I would much rather be landing on the runway and as soon as that XLR-11 has been fired up and used, well, I've got no propulsion on this plane whatsoever. But it is fine, I was able to go higher than the contract required and I was able to get the plane back safely down onto the runway. For this tiny little X plane, I picked 125 kilometers away from the space center, which seemed to be about right to bring it back down to the runway every time another happy landing. With a huge boost to confidence, the optional contracts tend to do that, and it was at this point I decided it was time to finally go appoint a leader, because I definitely didn't forget after completing the Carmen Line contract. I went with Glushko for that sweet, sweet reduction in researcher salaries. I plan on really pouring money into my R&D, so any savings I can get there will really help. Extra rep from contracts is pretty nice too, and the negative I don't have to worry about, having no plans of ever firing any of the leaders. Once again, babysitting time warp and spending all my funds on applicants as soon as I could brought my researchers up to 74 and my engineers to 82. This sudden influx of staff is absolutely great for morale as with all these new faces Thunderbolt 1 was now to be ready by the 30th of November meaning we will get the opportunity to launch a guided rocket in the first year of this program. Definitely something I was hoping for. Thunderbolt 1 on the 30th of November 1951 my first guided rocket in this series. I was really surprised to get this out before the end of the year. I'm fairly sure when I played PNLC before I did not get these kind of rockets out until at least year two, so clearly I'm doing okay. At least I think I might be. Anyway, this iteration of Thunderbolt has an A4 engine on its first stage, and I mean, it only has one stage. I did want to go with the RD-100, however, I did not know that that was actually locked behind early rocketry to begin with, or, or one of the first rocketry nodes, which really surprised me, because that's been a change. You used to get the RD-100 from the very beginning, and the RD-100 is a bit better than the A4, and the upgrades are much, much better, so it's definitely worth going down that route rather than the A4 to A9 which is a bit of a pointless upgrade unless you want it to be able to be airlit. If you're wondering where the camera is on this, it's actually inside the payload fairing. Now I know payload fairings are very heavy to begin with but I really 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 hate the look of that first camera part. I think it looks hideous. It doesn't fit with any of my rockets or any of my designs so I decided to hide it away. And because of that, well this did weigh a little bit more than I would have liked and unfortunately I don't quite get the distance that I wanted from this rocket. Rocket. Clearly, I didn't build my rocket enough, being quite shy of the downrange requirement for the film return contract, which I found strange as in testing the design worked. Damn variants. Still, a lot of science was gained which allowed me to pick up supersonic flight, early rocketry, and basic solid rocket engines, all of which will go a long way to making my first orbital thunderbolt, but that will come later. Now, a jump to December, a month which really I should not be launching in. It is a cursed month, which the majority of my failed engines in the original series happened, but on the 16th, I throw caution to the wind as the next blue sky is ready to be launched. And here we are, at the last launch of 1951 on the 16th of December, Blue Sky 2-2. Yes, there have been seven launches in this episode. That is quite a lot for a first year of an RP-1 save, but, but that is how programs and launch complexes work, and there are sure to be many, many, many more launches in the coming episode, because I have multiple launch complexes working on multiple rockets, and the efficiency is going to go up, and everything is just going to get speed- well, it's going to speedball out of control. It's, I'm going to have too much to show in one video. <laughs> It's gonna be crazy. Anyway, this is yet another intermediate altitude sounding rocket with 75 units of sounding payload attached to the top in a high pressure tank. Don't be like me when I started Kerbal Gets Real and use service modules for putting sounding payload in. Nope, use high pressure tanks. It is available. I was very dumb when I started that. High pressure tanks are cheaper, lighter, and just overall better for that purpose. Well, looks like I had nothing to worry about at all, because the second launch of Blue Sky 2 was a complete success. Well, I mean, it exploded, but that was the general idea. It worked okay. Completing yet another optional mission once again gave me even more confidence. Some of the later programs do require quite a bit, so it's nice to get a head start on that. A trip into the VAB again, because I'm finally at the upper limits of what Blue Sky can do for me. So a rather cheap upgrade to a two-ton launch complex is ordered. The commonality stays the same, even with the upgrade, which is great. No efficiency loss here at all. Only being a minor upgrade, that 
Friday's also quick to change and gets finished on the 29th, just in time for the end of the year. I know it is possible to start with a two-ton launch pad and just overburn your engines by filling up tanks to make the rocket more than one ton. You can't launch less than that on the two-ton pad, and this actually might be a good idea to do in future runs. I just didn't think of that for this one. Like I said earlier this video, mistakes may be made. On the 1st of January 1952 now, and in this year we'll be going faster, higher, and further than ever before. Hopefully at least. I mentioned before I want to be beating historical milestones, but there is definitely one milestone I would really like to beat, and that was my first orbit time in the original series, the 16th of August 1954. Reckon I can do it? Give me your predictions down in the comments and we'll see what happens. A big thanks to Y Mandarin, Darth Malakor, Moss Config, Mr. Blue Star, Ryan Miller, and the rest of my patrons and members for their continued support. I have been Karnassa, and I will see you later.